just a minute, but we'll pray. Heavenly Father, unless you build the house, labor labors in vain, unless you watch over the city, the watch, watch. And unless you build us up as your church, I will speak, we will listen. But if according to your faithful love that endures forever, you look upon us, you send out your Holy Spirit, and you speak your word to us, then we as a church will be built up, and your kingdom will come among us, and the Holy Spirit will come, and Jesus will be revealed, and you will be glorified. We pray that you would do this according to your love for us. Um, like I said, we're Mark 1 today, 21 through 28. And uh, we're talking about authority today, the need for qualified and trustworthy authority, both those things. Uh, a number of months ago, the World Economic Forum gathered in uh, Davos, Switzerland. They do it every year. They have these big conferences, and all these political leaders and business leaders and other elites get together, and they discuss all the the problems in the world and the things going on and, and you know how, to, how they think they should be addressed. And this year was a really interesting year because every other year when the World Economic Forum meets, the number one threat they say that's facing our world is climate change. This year, 2024 Davos, that was still high on their list. They're talking about it. But they actually said... For the next two years, at least, there will be an even greater threat to our world, climate change. That it was misinformation and disinformation. Now, I'm not a big fan of the World Economic Forum, but I actually do agree with them on that point. Lies are remarkably dangerous things. They can lead to riots and revolt and revolutions and wars and breakups and all these things can come from lies. And so I, I think they're actually right. I think that is probably the threat because there is this huge influx of misinformation all over the world, getting pumped, you know, like there's a straight line from it to our world. But here's the thing. Where is it all coming from? Why is there so much misinformation? And I'm not sure, but I think here's where me and the World Economic Forum might disagree. Um, I, my suspicion is they would say, and I would agree with them on this, that there's you know a lot of this misinformation, disinformation, fake news, misconstrued stuff, it's coming from people on the internet who are not qualified to be speaking on subjects, yet they are. They're speaking authoritatively on subjects that they really have no authority to speak about. And so they're inaccurate. They're misrepresenting things. I think that's true. I think that is the reason for a lot of the misinformation. However, here's where I think that WNF and MER would agree. Why are people listening to all these people on the Internet? Why are people looking to them and flocking to them? And it's because the qualified authorities, the people with degrees, the people with titles, the groups with, you know, channels and stuff that are supposed to be the authorities on subjects, have been found, largely speaking, totally unreliable and untrustworthy. And that people have seen that they lack integrity, and so they don't trust them. I mean, probably the easiest example we could look at is just the news. I, I hope this is not a shock to anyone, but news in Canada has... And, and I mean, it used to be good, but so much of what is on the news now is frankly straight propaganda. It's just they have their worldview that they want to push, and so the selection of stories, the spin they put on stories, the views they express that are acceptable and unacceptable... Is, I mean, it's palpable. You can't watch the news and not pick up on it. And so as a result, 
all these people have said, well, this, these authorities, these qualified authorities aren't trustworthy, so I'm going to look for someone else. And they find someone on the internet who at least seems sincere. And so the misinformation, we have actually two pipelines pouring it into our world, both sides. And uh, so you can see we have a problem. Because we need truth. Everyone knows we need truth. We need to know what's actually happening, what's actually true, what's actually going on. But the qualified authorities lack integrity. And the guys on the Internet lack accuracy. So who do you believe? Right? What? What's? <laughs> Amen, brother. Um, <laughs> who? Who do you believe? You know, where? Where do you go for the truth? Again, what we need is we need an authority that is both qualified and trustworthy. Right? We need, in other words, if to put it this way, we need someone who has the right to speak, but also when they speak, they say what is right. And. As our brother pointed out, we have Jesus Christ is the perfect authority. In Mark 1 today, which we read about, it is all about Jesus Christ's authority. What it presents to us is that he has the right to speak and he says what is right. And so kind of my plea this morning as we begin is in a world of misinformation and disinformation. I think that's true. I think it is the number one threat facing us. But to look to Jesus and to look to his authority and to submit to his authority because he's the only one we actually can fully trust. So with all that in mind, that is an introduction. Let's read verse 21 and 20. And they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribe. Have you ever had a teacher or a professor that just, you know, to their level of knowledge and their ability to communicate that knowledge just blew you away? Yeah, I remember my first class my undergrad, my first Old Testament class I took, I, I went home and I wrote, written my journals, I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but it was something like Dr. Anderson's knowledge is unbelievable. I could never dream of attaining to his level of knowledge and command of a subject. It was exhilarating and bewildering to sit in his lecture. It was just, it was amazing, the, the fount, how much he knew and his skill to communicate it and his passion It was incredible. I'm sure you guys have had teachers like that too. Here's the question. If just human teachers or human professors can do that, what must it have been like when the Son of God came into the synagogue, sat down, and started teaching? Would have been pretty cool, I think, right? It says that they were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. They were just, you know, this is the kind of preaching or teaching you listen to when everyone's kind of looking around at each other going, Daddy, are you hearing the same thing I'm hearing? And everyone's looking at each other. And it's just it's amazing just the absolute authority with which he spoke. He taught them as one who had authority. They were astonished. Now here's the interesting thing. I mean, so, you know, it's if Jesus taught, he had this amazing sermon, I would think Mark would have told us what he was talking about. I mean, what did he say that was so amazing? But if you look at the text, it doesn't tell us anything about what Jesus said. It doesn't give us a word of what Jesus actually said in that sermon. Kind of interesting. And the point is, is here is that the emphasis is not on what Jesus was saying, as important as that is. The emphasis is, is on how he was teaching. The fact that he was teaching with authority. These people could just discern his, his innate authority when he spoke. You know, have you ever had someone come home 
and they just they have this smile that they can't hide, and it's, it's an external thing, but you can just tell from that that there's some sort of happiness inside, something really great has happened to them, right? You can just tell something's going on. Well, in the same way, when Jesus spoke by his external words, these people could just detect this guy has authority. This guy knows what he's saying. What he says is right. They were used to all these scribes who would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so, this theologian thinks this, this other rabbi says this. Jesus stands up, doesn't quote anyone, doesn't cite anyone, doesn't speculate at all. He says, this is the truth. This is what it is. And the people are blown away by his authority. And that's good for us to remember, okay? That Jesus Christ, because he is the word of God, he speaks with authority. When we read his words in in the Gospels, or the words of his apostles in the epistles, because that's they're not making the stuff up. They got their teaching from Jesus. And when, so when we read Jesus' teaching in the New Testament, this is not just an opinion. This is not one perspective among many. This is the authoritative truth. This is how it is. Like when Jesus says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. That, you know, that, that's not uh, an interesting insight on, all. Oh, that's the way life goes at times. Uh, you know, that, that's not uh, a theory on how life works. That is truth. He has spoken authoritatively. This is what it is. And so, again, Jesus came into the synagogue with this incredible authority, and the people could just discern that he had this innate authority, this right to speak, qualified then next, that's verse 21, 22. Then next, not only is Jesus' authority discerned, his authority is also demonstrated. That's verse 23 through 26. You can read that now. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, bolstering him, crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. Imagine being in that church service. <laughs> Middle of the sermon. Guy stands up and starts yelling and screaming, and clearly it's not even his own natural voice. Demon, best man, starts speaking. Unnerving would probably be too light of a word there. I would, honestly, I think I would be scared if that happened, if someone just stood up and started hollering and screaming. That would be frightening, right? Because, I mean, let's keep in mind, demons are powerful beings. You know, it's in uh, Luke, it talks about the man who is uh, possessed by the legion of demons, and they try, they says they couldn't bind him with chains. They would try, they put these iron shackles on him, and he just snapped them like thread. Because the demon gave him this unnatural strength. And here, the demon convulses the man. It has control of his limbs and his vocal cords and all this stuff. I mean, that, that's, that's right. And I mean, here he is. He's in the middle of the congregation. This demon's in control of him. There's no telling what he's going to do. That's scary. Yeah, I'm really interested. If you have a Bible, look, look over the text again, or as much as you can, look over the text on the screen. Who is the most scared person in this synagogue? Demon. Yeah. He says, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? you know that the devil and demons live in constant terror? I mean, they, they, they try to terrify and terrorize others, but they themselves live in constant dread, fear. Why? 
because they know that ultimately the day is coming and they're charging towards it when they are going to be cast into a bottomless pit, to a lake of fire where they are tormented day and night forever and ever, and there's nothing they can do to avoid that death. Again, remember you know, the, the story of the legion of demons cast to the pigs, right? And they run off the cliff and they fall down. Very interesting. If you read that story carefully, I think you have to read Matthew and Luke to get all the details. But basically, when Jesus comes, the demon begs, here he says to Jesus, are you here to torment us before the time? And then he, they, the demons plead with Jesus not to send them into the abyss. So in other words, they just know that this time is coming when they're going to be thrown into the abyss, and they're just terrified of this reality. And they live in that terror all day, every day. And so needless to say, when Jesus walks into the synagogue and the demon sees him, there's a reason he shrieks with fear and starts crying out because he's afraid of Jesus. He knows who Jesus is. He says so, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Someone says, well, how did the demon know who Jesus was? Nobody else in the synagogue knew God's son. How did the demon know? Remember, this demon was created by Jesus. And there was once a time that this demon was an angel in heaven serving and worshiping the Son of God until he and Lucifer rebelled and fell from heaven. And so you see, this demon, he, is, he knows who Jesus is. He has seen him in the fullness of his glory in the Father's presence. And now he sees him on earth, so he's terrified of Jesus. And so Jesus, with his authority, commands the demon to come out of this man and leave him. And it says that he, uh, where is it here, he convulses the man and cries out with a loud voice. Yet, so in other words, the demon doesn't want to leave the man, but he has to. He doesn't have a choice. Because so great is Jesus' authority, the demon, as scary and strong as he is, he's powerless. So you see, Jesus' authority here is demonstrated. You know, it's it's easy to kind of stand up and kind of act bold, act like you know what you're talking about. But here, Jesus shows the people, I don't just sound like I know what I'm talking about. I have spiritual authority. And uh, that's what they say. They uh, they all, verse 27, they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits, they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere, throughout all the surrounding Galilee. So, Jesus' authority has been discerned. Now it's been demonstrated. Now it's being declared. I mean, what do you do when you when you find see something amazing, right? You go to all your friends, you text them and say, have you seen this new documentary? And did you see the game last night? Have you heard this song, right? That when we experience something amazing, incredible, that's what we do. Well, in the same way, these people, they see this authority of Jesus and they go and they tell everyone. And it spreads, you know, all over the city like fire through pop. So much so that if you have a Bible, if you look in verse 32, it actually says, By evening that same day, the entire city gathers to the door at the house where everyone knew within a matter of like eight hours. So fast. I think that tells us something, by the way. You know, the, the World Economic Forum says that misinformation is you know, the greatest threat. This lack of a qualified and trustworthy authority. I think it tells us that that is actually not a new problem. These people were looking, they were hungry for an authority that was qualified, an authority that they could trust, and they couldn't find it anywhere until Jesus came. 
And finally, they had this authority that they knew he was saying the truth. They knew he, he had the right to be saying it. And so when they finally found this authority, they need, knew they needed it. They told everyone about it. So we too, we need, have the same need today. So it's an exciting passage. Jesus' authority is power. It's discerned through his teaching. It's demonstrated through the demon. It's declared by all the people of Capernaum, to all Capernaum. And uh, I, I would, part of me would love to just stop here. But it's important that we go on to one last fourth point. And this is the dimmest of all the points of the sermon. That is, that it's true that in Capernaum, as Jesus goes into the synagogue, he preached. We have all our deeds. Authority was discerned. It was demonstrated. It was declared. But ultimately, Jesus' authority was denied by the people of Capernaum. Remember, in Mark chapter 1 right now, and like last week in verse 16 through 20, he just called his first four disciples. Like, this is like one, in, in this synagogue account in Capernaum, like this is one of the very first things he does. Okay, in Matthew 11, which happens much later on in his ministry, it says this: Then Jesus began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And then he says this, And you, Capernaum, where he is today, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Haiti. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom then or you. That's amazing. Jesus goes to Capernaum. People get all excited about his teaching. They go, we've never heard anyone teach like this before. This is the greatest sermon I've ever heard. I love coming to this guy's church. He cast out a demon. Have you ever seen anything like this? Look at his power. Then that evening, they bring everyone who's sick to him, and he heals them all. They see his authority, they love his authority, yet ultimately they deny it. And we go, how could that be? How could that happen? But honestly, that shouldn't surprise us at all. Because the same thing happens today. I mean, you have people who love talking about Jesus' miracle. Right? Or even... Atheists or people from other religions love to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. They say, what a great teaching from Jesus, and they'll cite Jesus as an authority for the Sermon on the Mount. Even overt Satanists will quote Jesus saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and they will quote Jesus as an authority. They all love Jesus' teaching on these things. And our world, too, they love Jesus when with his authority and his power, he rebukes the Pharisees and he elevates the prostitutes. Everyone loves Jesus. They get excited about Jesus. But the minute his authority is turned onto them, all of a sudden they deny it. Reject. When the question comes down to who will be the Lord, and master of my life, they reject Jesus' authority. When it comes down to needing to repent, to obey him, to acknowledge that he is the only way to the Father, and no one comes to God except through him, and everyone rejects his authority. And the same thing can happen with us. We can hear about his authority, we can get excited about his authority, we can even, maybe some of us have, seen his authority in really miraculous, powerful ways. Yeah, like the people of Capernaum, we can ultimately deny his authority. I wonder if there's anyone this morning that's struggling with Jesus' authority. 
you know that his teaching calls you to give something up. You don't want to give up. Or you know that he calls you to do something that you don't want to do. And to struggle to submit to the authority. Who is going to be the master of my life? Me or Jesus? I want to plead, like I said at the beginning, I want to plead with all of us, not just to hear, not just to get excited about, but to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Because he's the only authority that's actually trustworthy in the world. In my personal devotion readings, I came across this verse, Isaiah 48, verse 17. Not a famous verse, but this is what it says. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. Jesus, he teaches with great authority, but he also teaches what is best for us. Now, some of his commands are hard. Let's not make any ways about that. Some, I mean, he, he, his call, is, we talked about that last week, comes with a cost difficult. It does revolve, involve repentance. It involves submission to him. But it is done out of love. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you. And again, in our world of misinformation, disinformation, who can believe he's the only one who actually has, has the right to speak and will speak what is, what is right. He is absolutely Worthy. And so again, my plea is that we would submit, and, re- and it has to be that we would wrestle to submit to Jesus' authority. And if anyone really is having, you know, you know in your heart of hearts, this kind of this personal struggle between you and Jesus, where you want this, he says this. You think this is best, he says this is best. What I would appeal to you and remind you of is this. Jesus Christ cast out a demon from a man. Okay? Like this, the demon was, was convulsing the man. It was contorting his body. It was, it was possessing him. It, it was just total misery for this man. How did Jesus Christ use the authority? Set the man free. That's how Jesus uses the authority he has toward us. And, you know, probably, I could be wrong, probably, you know, none of us have ever been possessed by it. But Jesus has done something very, very similar for all of us. Okay? Colossians 2 says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. When it says that he disarmed the rulers and authorities, that's talking about demonic rulers and authorities. Okay? When you and I sin, Ultimately, what that is, is, is denying his authority over us. And when we walk in unrepentant sin, and we're stubborn, we just keep going in it, it is tempting to believe that therefore we have the authority over our lives. But that's a deception. If we walk in unrepentant sin, the demonic, as authority over our lives. And they use that authority to terrorize and destroy. But Jesus Christ, so great is his love that he was nailed to the cross so that our, the record of debts against all that sin that's enslaving us to the demonic would be put on the cross, nailed to it, canceled, washed away, And it says in Colossians 2 that when he did that, he disarmed 
the demonic rulers and authorities over our lives and put them to an open shame, openly humiliated. So in other words, when we come to Jesus and we confess our sins, I'm not talking about being perfect here, but I'm talking when we repent of our sins and confess to Jesus, the demons have no power over us. Just as the demon totally lost power over that demon-possessed man in the synagogue, the demon didn't want to leave, but it had to, because Jesus' authority told him he had to go. In the same way, when we confess our sins and we come to Jesus and we repent of them and we're washed clean, the demons have no choice. They might want power over us, but they cannot have. You see, this is how Jesus uses authority. John 10 says this. Jesus says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus Christ used his authority. And so when we're talking about, you know, submitting to his authority, you know, we're talking about a world of misinformation and lies, you know, who do you trust? What a, ble- what a blessing, what a privilege to first have a king we can trust, but also one, a king uses authority to save us. He doesn't torment us and throw us into the lake of fire like he does the demon. He uses his authority to lay down his life and save us. We can trust him. We can submit to him in whatever he says. Let's close with this verse. John 1, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, believed in his name, he gave authority to become children of God. Amen. Lord Jesus, who do we trust? We lift up our eyes to the hills, whom does our help come? Come from the maker of heaven and earth. You. You are the only authority in our world that we can trust all the way. Yet we confess to you that our hearts are often filled with unbelief or love for sin. So we go after that. But help us, Lord, for all of us to trust in you, to look to you, and to submit to you, and to rejoice that your authority is used to save us. And I pray that this hunger and thirst for qualified and trustworthy authority, this need, this great need in our world, people would find it met. You're the only one who will meet it. So do it in us, do it through, do it through us to others. Pray this in your name. Let's stand up. We'll confess our faith together.